right, Surah Al-Asr. In Surah Al-Asr, um, <coughs> I think there's a lot of people from Pakistan here, right? Um, my wife is Pakistani. We had the opportunity to visit Pakistan. And we went to uh, Multan. I went to different places from Multan. <laughs> okay. We went to Multan and I noticed, I, I became very, very sick in Multan. And the reason for the sickness, that I, and I determined I'm like studying the, the culture and so on, the reason for my sickness was because of their ice. Right, have you ever seen their, uh, where they get their ice from? It comes from the dirtiest truck you could ever see, where the guy just smashes the, the, you know, with an ice pick, it falls off the truck, he picks it up and he gives it to people, and then they take it home and they give you lemonade. Right? They keep sticking, they put like a few drops, you go, and then, you know, they give you a little sip of lemonade, but you don't realize that this water is melting in your cup. Right? It's poisonous water. It melts in your cup, and if you ever drink it, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from drinking that kind of water. So I became very sick, and they thought, oh, it's the mangoes that are messing you up, and I said, no, it was that ice. Anyhow, the ice cellar. And you'll see in the books of Tafsir, like I said, they'll mention stories like this, because this was their culture. In our society, we don't have people out in the street selling ice. You know, you go to 7-Eleven, you pick up as much ice as you want, you don't even think twice about it. But these people, they sell it out with no refrigerators. And so someone was contemplating what? Al-Asr, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testifying by the time. By the token of time, or by the time. And he saw, as he was thinking about this, he was sitting in the marketplace beside a guy who was selling ice. And he was watching him. And he noticed that by the end of the day, like he would sell the ice, sell the ice, but by the end of the day, whatever he didn't sell was destroyed. The ice had melted and it was perished and he could only take what he had sold. So he had to work very hard during the day in selling. Otherwise, by the end of the day, his commodity would be finished. And when the end of the day came and the rest of the ice had melted away and the person walked away with what he had, he realized the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifying by the time. That man is surely at a loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah is explaining the way that a person will either be successful or will be a loser. And the default, and the reason it says default there, is the default is that human beings are losers. They are losers. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْ That they're in loss. And they will be losers if they just allow the river of life to pass them by. They will be losers. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies by the time, that raises the status of time. You know when Muslims, they don't come on time for their lectures and stuff like that. Tell them that the time is mu'adham shara'an. The time is, uh, has lofty and noble status to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He testifies by it. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies by something, this is an exam question, so you can like, pay attention a little bit here. It shows that number one, that there are many blessings that can come from that thing. Many benefits. So number one, benefits. That come from that. Number two, that it reminds people of the precision of that creation. It reminds people of the precision of that creation, or for short, precision of creation. And number three, it reminds them of the enormity of that creation. The enormity of how big and how detailed this creation is, but people haven't paid attention to it. So the benefits, the precision, and the enormity. There was once, um, when I went to Amman, I told you these, uh, when I went to Petra and so on, there was uh, a Canadian peacekeeping officer that was in the hotel with us in Abdali, which is in Amman. And the brother that was with me, it was his first uh, chance giving da'wah, so he's telling him about the story of Adam and Iblis and how... So he's going on with the story and the guy's like, you know, he doesn't want to listen to it. So I basically said to him, I said, what do you worship? 
And he said, I don't worship anything. And I don't worship any religion. He said, because I can't leave aside my zina. He said, I can't leave aside my alcohol. I can't leave aside, you know, all these uh, worldly desires. And then I said to him in reply, I said that as Muslims we believe that everybody worships something. I said, even the words that you used were words of ubudiyya, were words of enslavement. He said, I cannot leave them. I'm enslaved to these things. But as a Muslim, we believe that our, um, our master is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we submit to him. And that's why a Muslim takes, um, takes pride in calling himself Abdullah and calling himself the slave of Allah. Even though people may translate it as the servant of Allah because it doesn't sound good in English, the word in Arabic is slave. Abd. If you said to someone, Oh, Abd, come here, it would be very derogatory. But when it's attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the greatest nobility that someone is Abdullah, the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why they became losers. Because the default is, they've chosen to worship themselves, and to worship their desires, and travel along the path of life in this obedience to their desires. The istitna, and we mentioned it a little while, uh, a few moments before, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying that all humans are losers. And I think on one of the poster boards, someone had said, I learned today that all humans are losers. <laughs> that we're all losers. Brother Muhammad said. That's incorrect. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying not all humans are losers. That they are in loss. Except. It's not everybody that's going to be a loser. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the exception. So what I mentioned earlier, when I said if there was a boy named... Uh, Hamza and he was in, you know, third grade boys. And we said the third grade boys went out for a recess except Hamza. That's called istithna in Arabic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that all these people are in loss except, and these people are not included. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the recipe for success. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ amin. So there are four things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. What, and these are the characteristics why they're not uh, losers in the end. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who had Iman وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَاتِ And they did the good deeds and the righteous actions وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ And they encouraged each other in the truth وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ And they encouraged people in patience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about this default of people in loss and the believer and how that they don't want to be a loser. Nobody wants to be a loser. Allah Azza wa says in Surah Ali Imran, verse 196, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't be deluded with these kuffar and as they pass in the land, that they only have a small commodity. And then their home and the place where they'll be going back to is hellfire. And what an evil, wretched place it is as an abode. Hellfire is. And so a Muslim doesn't look at all these people and like they say the road less traveled. This is the road that all these people are taking. A person should never think uh, or feel safe and see the mirage of people that are following them misguided. But they should turn to what will give them the success. The iman, the amal salih, the encouraging of haq and the encouraging of sab. Speaking about iman, Al-Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, a famous definition of iman that many people have quoted. He said, Al-imanu ma waqara fil qalbi wa saddaqahu al-amal. He said that iman is something that lodges in the heart and it's proven by actions. It's proven by action. In that point, because sometimes you see, uh, this is like a little joke, and, and this happened overseas. One brother was giving a lecture, and, and someone, I guess, really rough uh, collar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had said to him, brother, where's your beard? You know, why don't you have a beard? And so the speaker said that, look, I believe that the beard comes from the, from the heart. And then the person had replied, you know, he has his chance, right? He said, then you must have a pretty hairy chest. Right, and in that statement, because a lot of believers they think 
that the iman, like you tell someone do this, they say, brother, it's all about intentions. But let them say the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ The actions will be judged by intentions. This person is doing nothing and saying that they have a proper intention. An intention for what? When they do something, then they will be judged by their intention. They give $5,000 sadaqah, then they will be judged by their intention. If they don't give, what intention is there? They haven't done anything to have an intention attached to that. And so it's إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ That the actions will be judged by intentions. And so it has to be iman and to be proven with amal. To be proven with amal. Because when someone doesn't work, whether they say it's, oh my intention is this and that, their actions are a reflection of what's in their heart. And it's reflecting and radiating from their heart. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in the hearts. We can only comment on what we see on the outside. And of course, Jannah is not in um, compensation for a person's action. So it's not that you pull out, um, or a binder for example could be worth $15. So someone pulls out $15, the $15 is worth the binder. Jannah is not the compensation for someone's um, uh, deeds. So they said, I've been worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 30 years of my life. Here's the compensation, here's Jannah. Jannah is not the equivalent of our deeds. But it's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person's embrace that they get elevated into paradise with the little work that they did in this dunya. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, and none of you will enter Jannah with your actions. And they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. And he said, not even me, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would embrace me with his mercy. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that actually teaches us not to be arrogant with our actions. But we do our actions in the hope that we could win the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we would be um, accepted by him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the ulama said, they said the a'mal al-saliha, the, the good actions, it's in benefit to the person who does it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need our actions. When, when someone slaughters on Eid, for example, on Eid, prayer, they slaughter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the blood and the meat do not reach Allah azza wa jal. Allah doesn't need that food, doesn't need to eat it. وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ But the taqwa, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what reaches Allah azza wa jal. And so those actions are for our own benefit. And when someone does uh, an evil action, they're not harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not being harmed, but they're actually harming their own body. Because it's their body that's going to be punished for that action. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ those who did dhulm to themselves. They're tyrants against their own limbs. Because their evil actions will harm themselves. And it will come back on them. Good or bad. As the hadith Qudsi uh, says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا هِيَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ أُحْصِيهَا لَكُمْ That it's nothing in your actions which I count for you and gather for you. ثُمَّ أُوَفِّيكُمْ إِيَّا And then I pay you back for those actions. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا So whoever finds good, فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Let them thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكُ Whoever finds something else, فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَ That he shouldn't uh, complain about anyone except himself. We also see in this surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ They did, they believed, and they did the good actions, وَتَوَاصَوْا And they encouraged the haqq. Of course they accepted the haqq themselves, but that wasn't good enough. They had to encourage it. And it's a social religion, about carpooling and going to the masjid with your friends, and, and being brothers and sisters and so on. This is what the religion is about. And it's actually a mistake when someone, you'll see in some uh, Muslim countries, for example, when you go to the masajid, you'll see all the senior men in the masjid. Where are their wives? Where are their children? It's almost as if they're only concerned with themselves. And this is incorrect. The person has to encourage the haq. And they have to encourage patience. And it's not enough that they say that I'm doing it myself and I'm already absolved of any sin. No, they're responsible for the people around them. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ
And in fact, when a person tries doing it on their own, they're away from everyone, you will see that when they distance themselves from the vibes of Iman, right? When they distance themselves from the recitation of Qur'an, from the good brothers, then the heart becomes rusted. It rusts away when they're not remembered, reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages the jama'ah so much, because in that jama'ah, the weak will be strengthened. The weak will be strengthened in that. And that's what a Muslim has to do, encouraging the truth and encouraging patience. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu you see from the sunnah, that he um, encouraged people to not travel alone. To not travel alone and not sleep alone. And, and some people may be interested about that because they may have an apartment by themselves. And this is actually something that the Prophet sallallahu um, said that we shouldn't do. He said, concerning about traveling, the Prophet sallallahu said, Ar-Rakibu Shaytan. That one, a, a person traveling by themselves is a shaytan, is a devil. Ar-Rakiban Shaytanan. And two people traveling are two devils and three of them are um, is like a, a group of people traveling but before that one and two are shaitan and actually I remember remember a brother he would travel by bus across the US and he was telling us we were little kids they weren't shy to tell us he would say that when he was out on a bus that he would get the chance to smoke you know that exciting thing to do he would go out from the bus and they'd be in, in the middle of the desert of America somewhere and then no one would see him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he'd pull out a cigarette and he would smoke. And he couldn't do this with his family. And he couldn't do this um, in any Islamic school or so on. But because he was traveling alone, he, he could get away with it. And this is what happens when someone travels alone. The Prophet sallallahu also said that a person shouldn't sleep alone. They shouldn't like just be by themselves and sleeping. Because when they get that chance, you know, you, and you know how, how it is when a person's alone, that's when... You know, the shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dwindles and then the person has, you know, the, um, like they say, the guts or the, the courage to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's where the shaitan really takes control of a person. Sabr, there's three types of sabr, wa tawasul bil haqqi wa tawasul bil sabr. Because a lot of people when they think patience, they think that, oh, we should have patience when um, calamities befall us. There's three types, they say the first type of sabr, a sabr, fi ta'atillah to be patient in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be patient in obedience to Allah azza wa jal so if Allah azza wa jal tells us to pray on time we should uh, have patience and make sure that we pray our prayers on time the second one is sabru an ma'siyatillah sabru uh, in not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if Allah azza wa jal says do not eat pork and then someone at the school is offering a ham sandwich to you you have to be patient and not accept that mayonnaise infested ham sandwich. The third type is as-sabru fi qada'illahi wa qadari, which is the patience in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the things that happened to us, things that we had no control over. And those are the things like the deaths and our sandals being torn or our sandals getting stolen from the masjid or something like that, that you have no control over. That as soon as you see that, don't let the chance I pass you by, say, إِنَّ لِلَّهُ إِنَّ لَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Immediately. So that you can reap the full reward. Because a lot of people, they, you know, later on say it. You know, after they've calmed down and they let off all their anger and then it's a, إِنَّ لِلَّهُ إِنَّ لَيْهِ After that. Right? It comes after. But it shouldn't. You should say, oh, I got the chance to get major blessings here. إِنَّ لِلَّهُ إِنَّ لَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Right? And I say this, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actually I said this in College Park, I think this day on Saturday, and a brother double parked me right after the, right after the speech. And I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing me. And I said, inna lillahi wa inna raja. And I kept saying it again and again. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that if there was no surah revealed of the Qur'an except this surah, it would be enough for the believers to contemplate over and to carry them through their lives. And that just shows you these small uh, uh, surahs, they are small, but at the same time, they are enormous in their meanings and in their messages of lies. And this is just, we just spent maybe half an hour on Surah Al-Asr, but you can write volumes and volumes about the truth, about patience, about iman, about amal al-salih, all of that. 
but this is the message of our lives that we're taking in these surahs so that every time we recite it in salah that we keep reminding of what is our path of success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines for us. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ The haqq is the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the rights of Allah Azza wa Jalla. You always see people talking about human rights, human rights, human rights, and they're always talking about it. And you don't see any um, United Nations uh, standing up for the rights of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Correct? You don't see that. And Inshallah, we'd like to see it. Right? They would call it a mutawa factory or something like that. Right? But people standing up for the haq Allah, the haq of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and the haq of the people. And the animals and the trees and all that, it's all there as the Prophet Wasallam said, to give every owner of haq, uh, every owner of a right, its right. And that's the justice that a Muslim must have. And so it's, if a Muslim sees a cat, for example, they're merciful to the cat because that's the haq. I remember one of the shiuch in Medina, he gave maybe a two hour lecture about the rights of animals in Islam. And you would be shocked when you go in detail of the rights of trees, the rights of plants, the rights of animals. It's ingrained in our deen. And it's all there, we just don't see it. And we haven't contemplated on this. وَتَوَاصُ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصُ بِالصَّبْ I'm going to uh, mention a story to you, inshaAllah. This is concerning Surah Al-As. There's mention that Amr ibn al-As, who became Muslim later, but he was one of uh, the toughest enemies against the Prophet wasallam. but he later on became Muslim. He went to Musaylim al kadhab in a delegation. And this was after the Prophet ﷺ had received revelation and before Amr had become Muslim. So, فَقَالَ لَهُ Musaylim Musaylim said to them, مَاذَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى صَاحِبُكُمْ فِي هَذِهِ الْمُدَّةِ He said, what has been revealed to your companion in this time? فَقَالَ لَقَدْ أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ سُورَةً وَجِيزَةً بَلِيغَةً He said that a small uh, surah which is short, but it's uh, very profound, has been revealed. And then he said, وَمَا هِيَ فَقَالَ And he replied, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّبْ So Musaylima, it says, فَفَكَّرَ Musaylima هُنَيْهَا uh, He, he uh, sat quietly for a moment, and then he said, وَقَدْ أُنزِلَ عَلَيَّ مِثْلُهَا He said, and upon me, a similar revelation has come down. فَقَالَ لَهُ عَمْرُ وَمَا هُوَ And what is that revelation? So he said, يَا وَبَرْ يَا وَبَرْ وَإِنَّمَا أَنْتَ أَذْنَانٌ وَصَدَرْ وَسَائِرُكَ حَفْرُ النَّقَرْ Which is basically talking about, uh, I think you say in English, a gnat, G-N-A-T, is that how you pronounce it? It's about a bug. And he's saying that you're basically um, ears and a chest. And the rest of you is hafra. And so, um, Amr looked at him, and then he said, ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كَيْفَ تَرَى يَا عَمْرِ He said, what is your opinion, O Amr? فَقَالَ لَهُ عَمْرِ He said, wallahi. He said, wallahi, إِنَّكَ لَتَعْلَمُ أَنِّي أَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ كَذَّابُ He said, I swear by Allah that you know that I know that you're a liar. Not that I swear by Allah that you're a liar. He said, I swear that you know that I know that you're a liar. أَنَّكَ كَذَّابُ and they mentioned this uh, concerning certain us. Mm-hmm.